This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist and I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas for almost 30 years. I began Self Work almost six years ago in order to extend the walls of my practice and talk about what I felt like was important for people to know about really good mental health treatment, good information, reliable information about mental health and mental illness. And that's been my mission for now almost six years. I'm reaching out to those of you who might already be very interested. Maybe you're in therapy to those of you who have just been diagnosed or you realize you're going through something that you don't understand and are looking for some answers, but also to those of you who might think therapy is a little on the strange side. Maybe it's for people who can't solve their own problems, but I want you to know that I'm a therapist because I got good therapy. I know what a substantial difference it can make in your life. So self-work The podcast isn't therapy, but you can get a pretty good idea of what it might be like to talk to somebody like me by listening, and you might just be unhappy enough, sadly, to do just that. But welcome. Welcome to all of you. This is a really great interview. I'm so excited about introducing you to Sarah Fay. She's the former editor at the Paris Review. She's an activist and a new author of Pathological, the true story of six misdiagnoses. It just came out in late March of this year. Almost one in five people, 47.1 million in the United States, have been diagnosed with a mental health condition, and that number increased by about one and a half million from last year. But what we need to ask is, is diagnosis the path to healing, or is it a self-fulfilling prophecy? That's the question that Sarah Fay has been trying to answer. It's an uncomfortable but necessary question. It's not that she hasn't struggled with mental illness. She has. But her doctors were extremely quick to pull a diagnostic label out of the hat, actually six different ones over the years, and then they treated her as that and only that diagnosis. Sounds like sort of an objectification, doesn't it? Oh, you're the bipolar kind of thing. You've heard me talk about that. They were also very quick to pull out prescription pads and recommend certain medications, many of which were very difficult for Sarah to tolerate. Now, we both wanted to point out that psychiatrists and other mental health providers have their work cut out for them. As a provider myself, I know how difficult it can be to work through what is normal grief and what's unresolved trauma. Or the question could be if mood swings might reflect bipolar disorder or something else. Is someone anorexic if they lose their appetite due to stress and become very thin? Or is it truly anorexia? These questions are harder to answer than you might think. I remember in graduate school being taught that diagnostic labels were very subjective given how much the diagnoses share symptoms and signs. There's a lot of overlap, but many clinicians are not taught that it would seem. It takes listening and listening for more than just a few minutes. In fact, if some of you listened to Talia Marone Schatz's interview, she said to us that it takes most of us 75 to 90 seconds to describe a problem to a doctor, and they usually listen and then interrupt at 11 seconds. (laughs) So I imagine that Sarah Fay also experienced that. But here are some of the things that we're going to talk about. Sarah tells us she almost became her diagnosis. She came to inhabit them and what helped her break out of that pattern. She wants you to know that your mental health diagnosis is not your identity. She wants to provide you with some questions to ask your doctor when you do receive a diagnosis, especially if you're experiencing grief from the pandemic. That is not mental illness. She's going to talk about how to navigate listening to your doctor without losing yourself and why our conversation about mental health has stagnated. And you know me well enough what we can do about it. (laughs) Those of you who've read my articles or listened here on Self Work, to podcast about perfectly hidden depression, know that I also have intense misgivings and great concern over how the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, is being overutilized in a manner in which it was never intended to be used. I have great respect for the effort and the original intention, but rigid use of it to guide decision-making is what needs to be avoided. I greatly enjoyed this interview with Sarah. 
And if you've ever wondered, is my diagnosis right? Or does my diagnosis make sense to me and fit my experience? Then perhaps not only do you need to listen to your gut, but you could listen to this episode. Before I bring you Dr. Fay, let's hear from BetterHelp, who has a wonderful offer for you as a special listener of Self Work. I'm proud to say that BetterHelp has been a sponsor of Self Work for more than two years now. They're ranked often as number one when compared with other professional therapeutic online services and do their best to match you with a therapist that you'll feel gets you, is attuned to you, and with whom you can find the kind of help and healing you need. You can do video sessions, you can text, because BetterHelp wants to offer you the most accessible and private therapy they can. Their therapists are licensed professionals. In fact, I've received offers from BetterHelp to become one of their therapists, but self-work keeps me busy. So if you need services that are financially affordable and convenient, then trying BetterHelp may be the best choice you've ever made for yourself. And you get 10% off your first month of services if you use this link, betterhelp.com slash self-work. You know, I'm a therapist because I got good therapy, because I learned the immense value of hearing another experienced and knowledgeable perspective on my own life from someone that cared and was invested in my getting better. So try BetterHelp and get one month at a 10% discount, betterhelp.com slash self-work. And now, I bring you Dr. Sarah Fay. So, I was enraptured with it all day Saturday. I started about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I don't think I got up till 5 o'clock in the afternoon. My husband said, what are you doing? I said, this book is incredible. And the powerful message that you weave throughout is obviously this emergence of the DSM, which for self-work listeners that don't know, it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatry. I've forgotten. The rest mental of the disorders. Yeah. There you go. Mental disorders and how that has become the Bible of psychiatry and psychology. And it's all based on an old brain disease theory. And tell me about your passion about getting that message out. So it, you know, one thing I want to just stress is that although we're going to call into question the DSM as it's called, um, I always want to preface this that um, mental illness is very real. I had one, um, no question. So even though we're calling into question the diagnoses that we use to describe mental illness, we're not questioning mental illness. You know, just to be very, very clear about that. Eloquent distinction, and I appreciate you. Yeah. So I spent 25 years in the mental health system and didn't know what the DSM was. I'd never heard of it. And that seems wrong to me, right? So why after, you know, I've been given six different diagnoses from this book called the DSM, starting when I was in eighth grade, um, I first received a diagnosis of anorexia. Then I was told in my 20s, no, I have generalized anxiety disorder. Then it was major depressive disorder. In my 30s, I was told, no, it's ADHD. Then I was told it was OCD. Then I was given this complex cocktail or combination of uh, ADHD ADHD. slash OCD with depressed anxiety and depression and anxiety elements. (laughs) Exactly. I was like, oh, that's lovely. Thank you for that. And then in my 40s, I was finally told that I had um, bipolar disorder. And so to me, you know, there was this mystery as to where my diagnoses came from, but I didn't even start to ask that question or try to discover the answer to that mystery until I was told that I had bipolar disorder. I was in my 40s. I could no longer live independently. I was living with my mother. I was suicidal. I was in crisis. I'd had a falling out with my psychiatrist. I was out of medication. I mean, I was in the worst possible place a human can be with mental illness. And my sister swept in. My sister is one of the heroes of my book. Um, Families are the heroes of these stories so often, and certainly mine was. Um, But she found me a psychiatrist. I went to see him. We had the 30-minute consultation. And I waited for him to proclaim my diagnosis at the end. So to say, yes, you have bipolar disorder, or no, you've got this new diagnosis, diagnosis number seven. And instead he looked at me and he said, I don't know what you have. I know. I loved that. <laughs> and I was like, I just smiled. I almost got up and clapped. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I doctor clapped. who says, gosh, I don't know yet. 
<laughs> and it really changed everything for me. And then that was the moment because no one had done that before. No one had said, wait a second, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to think about this and I'm going to not proclaim who you are and what is wrong with you, according to this book called the DSM, um, right away after 30 minutes. Um, but that was the moment when I decided I'm going to find out everything I can about mental health diagnoses. I'm going to finally find out what they even are. And then I found out they are basically these categories found in a book called the DSM. And if you were to open the DSM's pages, you would see at the top of the page, major depressive disorder, and then symptoms listed underneath. And then you have to qualify for it with a five certain number of symptoms, five <laughs> out of nine, <laughs> uh, to get major depressive disorder. And, and it is, it's, um, you know, one story about it. When we talk about that, these diagnoses are not valid or reliable, What's meant by that is that they can't be objectively proven. So even though I, I learned that in graduate school, I mean, oh and it, it, was yeah, kind of the, it was several studies that showed that if you trotted someone in and they told the same story to 10 different mental health practitioners, that you would get diverse kinds of diagnoses. And that's something I was taught that kind of what sense of, you know, this isn't the be all end all. And yet that was 30 years ago. And I think wow. the profession has evolved. I don't know if graduate students are learning that or certainly not medical students. Well, you were way ahead of the curve because I mean, fr from, you know, what I've learned is actually that, you know, many medical students do learn from the DSM. They are taught the DSM. I mean, one defense is that no, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists don't really use it. Um, and that's a little scarier to me than actually using it, despite its flaws, because then that means you're just getting someone's opinion, like one person. I mean, I have a lot of criticisms about the DSM, but I want to be clear to say it's useful because we use it. And we have to get people help and treatment. And what it was initially designed to do would be to offer to the international mental health community a common language so that someone in France and someone in Canada and someone in Iran and someone in China and someone in Japan, all those people would be sort of talking about the same thing so that you could have a dialogue and you could share research and that kind of thing, which is an honorable way for it to have evolved. And yet it has become, and I, you know, I'm not a, a researcher, but but I have been told by way too many people in my own study of, of my work is on is that frequently happens when they present with this condition that doesn't look like depression and somebody pulls out their DSM-5 and says, see, you, you don't belong here. Here are the symptoms. I think one thing, um, one thing I was just talking to a lawyer who actually defends people who are um, in guardianship. So they're severe, have severe mental illness. But one thing she was saying is that those she's come in contact with actually go on kind of like we all do in, in the public and the patients, we have ideas of what major depressive disorder is. Yeah. So we aren't looking at the pages of the DSM, but diagnoses are all around us. Even if listeners have never heard of the DSM, there are memes and there are TikTok therapists diagnosing people and we self-diagnose and we diagnose our presidents. And like, you know, I mean, we are, ever, they're everywhere and they're in us. They're very much um, someone, uh, one theorist describes the DSM as a work of culture that it really is a part of our culture. And it's, you know, we use the term depression, the disorder, the same way that we call it depression, the emotion. Like we even equate them. Wow. And they've become in our... considered that. That's incredible. Yeah. They are in our culture. I should say the name of your book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pathological, the true story of six misdiagnoses. Now looking back on those, all those different diagnoses. And again... I think you did have anorexia, correct? I mean, it, that that wasn't necessarily a diagnosis that your your premier diagnosis that was wrong. It just probably wasn't enough. Somebody wasn't looking at you holistically enough. I think you know it's a great question in the sense of it's something I still ask myself, and it's something I ask in the book. So there was a context, and I think the problem with diagnoses is that we get the diagnosis and the question, the conversation ends. 
you know, or every conversation we have reifies the diagnosis. It confirms the diagnosis. This is because of my depression. This is because of my anxiety. If you're talking to a therapist. Um, and so what happened to me when I was young, I mean, I was only 13, 12 years old and my parents were divorcing and I was going to a new high school and I was extraordinarily sad and I was terrified and I had a stomach ache that was like a black pit in my, you know, in my and gut. And it just pit. That's real. Yeah. Thing. It a sodden and, pit. and I didn't want to eat. I would say I couldn't eat. Mm. And, and so there's a difference. I didn't really exhibit at that moment, the three classic signs of anorexia. So I wasn't weighing myself. I wasn't counting calories and I didn't think I was fat. I didn't have body dysmorphia. Okay. So again, there's a question there, but then what happened was, and there's even more of a risk of this today, especially with young people. We didn't have the internet back then. I feel like I'm really old, but <laughs> back then, <laughs> but um, it didn't matter. We didn't have thin spo sites or pro Anna Instagram where we we're encouraging a disordered eating behaviors and, and kind of proselytizing the diagnosis. But I ended up finding a novel in which the girl, the protagonist was um, a, had anorexia. Oh, yeah. And it was like a lot of eating disorder memoirs today. It was like a cheat sheet on how to be an anorexic. And so I just modeled myself after her. Once my pediatrician who weighed me saw my weight, asked nothing about the context or what was going on in my life and said, she has anorexia. I became an anorexic at that moment. Exactly. Do so you see like, it, it, you know, so which came first? I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I understand. It's a sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy for sure. Exactly. You know, the, the thing that I was, again, as a clinician and as I, was, as I was reading, you kept saying in slightly different ways, as you recall those different episodes of your life, and I'll quote one of them, you said, my emotions were foreign to me. You know, almost every episode where you had diagnosed with anxiety or whatever it was, this painful emotion was something that you could not express. And yet no one seemed to pay attention to that. They were more interested in diagnosing you rather than actually understanding, well, wait a minute, what's going on that she can't tune in or even express these things that are so, so, so much of a struggle? I mean, even, you know, I was in and out of partial hospitalization programs and we would get, I remember in one skills session, I mean, I did cognitive behavioral therapy. I did dialectical behavioral therapy. I did DBT act. I did all the acronyms. Like I did them all um, it, within my treatment. And, but anyway, in one skill session, we were handed the emotion wheel where it has like a hundred emotions and they all have different colors. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. Like I can't even, <laughs> I can do happy and sad. And like, that's about it. I mean, I didn't even know nuance at all, but I mean, I learned what an emotion is last year. I'm 50 years old. I mean, that should have come. I didn't even know that there are vibrations in our bodies and that they're really, you know, respond. I mean, it depends who you believe. I've done, now been doing a lot of research on it for my new book, which is the sequel to Pathological. Um, and it's a lot about this, that I really didn't know what my emotions were or what emotions are. And of course, there are different theories about them and different people have different takes on it. But, you know, all of that, if I had been given that, and again, I'm not doubting even like you know, my doctors at that time, and certainly not my parents at that time, because we just didn't have this language. Mm -hmm. But if I'd been taught what my emotions are and how to process them and not just been diagnosed and thought, okay, every time I have this pit in my stomach or every time I feel this rush in my chest or I have a panic attack or whatever it is, it's not necessarily because of a diagnosis. Mm -mm. You know, th those are actually human emotions. Yes. And I, I think that another phrase you use, let me see if I can, I read the Thomas and I'm going to crucify his last name, Saz or Saz? Saz, the, yeah. Saz, the myth of mental illness. I also read yeah. that book in graduate school. So <laughs> where he says mental illness comes from problems with living, but what you also yeah. stress about what has happened in psychiatry and in some ways psychology, I guess, too, is that what what are normal responses to things? I mean, you were, after your beloved cat died, you know, and you were grieving for not only that, but I think a relationship with Chris had ended yeah. around the same time and you'd moved to New York and, and you were struggling and 
you know, it was like, oh, that's depression rather than automatically assuming it must have a diagnosis rather than being a part of a human condition. Yeah. And going back to the DSM, I think, you know, the the problem I have looking back now is that, you know, what would be if I could, you know, write the alternate narrative of what should have happened. And I'm not saying this should have happened, but um, but what if someone had sat down with me, the therapist I went to see and that therapist had said, you know, we don't know a lot about the brain and we don't know a lot about mental illness, but we use these diagnoses. And this is the one I think you're closest to. It's major depressive disorder. And we're going to use that as our guide to get you treated treatment. And I'm recommending you use this medication, but we're going to check in in two weeks or a month or three months. And we're going to see if you still need the medication. And then we're going to wean you off it if you're doing better. That never happened with me. No one ever said I could heal. No one ever said I could go off medication. And so, you know, I'm still on it, even though I have healed and I will be on it probably for the rest of my life. And that's fine with me. I have no problem with that because I I, I do believe my body's dependent on it. My withdrawal symptoms are too severe for me to, to do it again. And my side effect profile is low. You know, Terry changed her. Yeah. You know, she talks a lot about that her medication has been a, a real savior for her and that she... Yeah. Yeah, Because she has severe bipolar disorder. And so, but it's this combination of what she's learned in therapy and all these things that she does for herself to remind herself when she's headed up or headed down, you know, how she can more balance herself. And and the fact that nobody did that with you and you saw psychologists too. You didn't just see psychiatrists, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that makes me sad for you, especially, and for other people who have that kind of treatment, because that's, you know, the, the phrase that immediately comes to my mind is humility, that mm-hmm. it it is just this sense of I'm not going to enter your life in 30 minutes and and believe that I can sum you all up in, in that period of time and slap a label on you and then send you to some prescriber in my, I mean, I don't prescribe. So, and then make them see you that way too. So they're looking through the same lens I am. So I don't have to question my own, you know, diagnosis. I don't yeah. know, just humility. Yeah. And that's really what, I don't think anyone meant to do me harm. I, I really don't. I'm not anti-psychiatry. I, in fact, I've come out of this oddly, maybe oddly, with more respect for psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists, because what they're trying to deal with, I mean, the brain, like there are what, 10 billion neurons, good luck. Like, and then what's the (laughs) mind? I mean, we don't even know. Uh -uh. So I just really, you know, they've got a very, very difficult task and we're asking them to solve our mental and emotional anguish. And, and that's, that's a tall order. So, you know, I really do have a lot of respect for them, but where I, you know, the sort of villain in the book, Dr. M, it was his hubris. It was his arrogance that was dangerous, really. I mean, you know, he was so determined to make me bipolar Mm -hmm. that we never stepped back, as I said, and reassessed or thought, is this the right diagnosis? Am I getting the right medication? Am I getting the treatment I need? Like that, to me, ideally would be an integral part of all treatment. Now, remembering, I, I thought he was the one that diagnosed you with OCD. That was the, you know, he, which one? I mean, there were so many. Which one? (laughs) Dr. M actually was the bipolar expert with the grapefruit. Oh, that's LaCroix. Yeah. All right. All right. His signature drink. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, you also point out, and having had COVID a few months ago, I certainly took a, saw a huge dose of this myself, is that. The United States is one of three countries, I did not know this, that has direct to consumer marketing for psychotropic medications. Yeah. (laughs) Wow. That's incredible. And for those of you, psychotropic just means uh, medications that treat mental illness. So that's what that means. So what are the other two countries? Um. I don't know, actually. I, I want to say it's Canada, but that doesn't sound right. They're pretty conscientious in that way. Um, but I don't know now that I think about it. Um, you know, I, I, what, what my experience was, was I, <laughs> there were two things that inundated me. There were medication commercials and there were accident lawyers who (laughs) were going to protect me from getting screwed by insurance companies, you know? And so those were the two things I came back with, but I wonder, 
how you, you you do obviously look back on it without rancor and and even with respect for the profession, but you must have been you you paint yourself so realistically, as does Terry Cheney, about just how anguishing these symptoms were for you and to spend two decades or more in this kind of, and I know that there are going to be people listening who say, I, I know exactly how she feels. I, I've gone from diagnosis to diagnosis, medication to medication, therapist to therapist. And it just seems that, I mean, it, it's just a, I mean, do you kind of question how you survived? Oh yeah. I mean, I have a little, a ritual, not a little, a big one, but a ritual every morning I walk every morning and every morning I remember that I almost died. And I remember I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful I could write this book and it had, you know, pathological has in it everything I wish I'd known. I mean, I'm a researcher, I have a PhD. So that was what I wanted to give everyone was all the information about these diagnoses that I wish I'd known. And and to speak to those people who are listening who have had multiple diagnoses or their children are getting multiple diagnoses, either one after another or all at the same time. I mean, I I teach at a university, so I have students coming to me with three or four diagnoses. Um, And yeah, I mean, it's really astounding and and much more so than ever before. And we do know that um, diagnoses of anxiety and depression in children five to, and then teenagers to 18 have gone up 30% since 2016. So it really, the rate of diagnosis is going up. That could be a good thing. That could mean that we're catching people who needed the diagnosis. Exactly. It could mean we're overdiagnosing. Exactly. You know, there's no way to know, really. So we err on the side of caution, and we, we usually consider that to be a good thing. But again, the problem is that, you know, the the cautionary tale and pathological that I would, you know, that I wanted to give to parents and also anyone who's been diagnosed at all. But when you're that young... And someone tells you you're a diagnosis, you start to see life and yourself through a lens of diagnosis. And so by the time I was told that I had bipolar disorder, I had so over identified with it. I believed I would die 10 years early. I believed I'd never hold a full time job. I believe I'd never be in a long term relationship. Those are stories about bipolar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you know, they're, they're readily available on the Internet. But some of this physician, you know, my doctors told me um, and, and warned me about that I would continue to cycle in and out of mania and depression. Um, and so, you know, and, and at the same time, there was, you know, no way to know for sure if what I was experiencing was mania and depression or it could have been depression and anxiety, right? Like, where do these, I mean, the problem with these diagnoses is that they can look alike. I mean, I think any psychiatrist, or and you might be able to speak to this too, manic depression has been around for a very long time. Oh, I mean, it is... It, It is real and it is a thing. And it is, um, to my understanding, unmistakable when you see it. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but, you know, no one saw mine. um, So it was my self-reported symptoms being interpreted by my clinician. And so that's where we run into trouble in some ways. Like, is this anxiety disorder or is this someone, a young person who spent two years in their bedroom because of the pandemic? Mm -hmm. You know, like, where are we in this Mm -hmm. exactly? Yeah. Oh, the pandemic has greatly confused things for an already yes. confusing kind of uh, pattern or spectrum. And, and you know, I guess a medical doctor can far more easily diagnose, you know, severe pneumonia than they can. Well, this might lead to pneumonia. I mean, or, mm-hmm. you know, it's something might lead. To, I mean, it's, it's hard you know, because when you say, oh, when you see manic depression, when you see bipolar illness, you know it. When Yes, I've seen it. I know it. But when mm-hmm. I think about the people that I can tell you, yes, I've seen that. They are the more severe, the more yeah. there there is more of a that things don't have as much of gradation. It's more up, down, up, down. I mean, there was a woman I worked with many years ago who was a very popular teacher and professor at a, the local university here. But literally, she would go home when she was down. She'd make herself go teach and then lock herself mm-hmm. in her bedroom and get under her bed 
and cry and be in fetal position because she was so depressed and wanted to hurt herself. And she thought, I've got to lock myself away from any way that I can do that. And and luckily, we, we were help. I, I was able, oh, she helped herself or whatever. She, we, you know, she got better. Um, but it is much more when things are more subtle, it's it's hard. I had a psychiatrist tell me that I was bipolar years ago when I was in graduate school and he put me on lithium and it was like dragging around, not just a cannonball, but the whole cannon. I mean, I was, I was just, all, I mean, I was a little tiny little thing at the time and I felt like I weighed about 250 pounds and, and I said, I can't do this. I, I, I'd rather be bipolar than be on lithium. Now, for <laughs> many of you who might be on lithium, great, but it was not, I wasn't bipolar. I just was, uh, I actually was just really shame filled and trying to get away from it. So there you go. I mean, it's really, you know, it, it's so tricky. And, and I think, you know, again, it's, it, it's, there's no question when, you know, all mental and emotional suffering deserves attention and it's painful and we need to honor it. And the problem with the DSM and the diagnoses that we use is that we don't know how to measure dysfunction. So you talk about that professor and someone might have looked at her and said, well, she's teaching, she's holding down a job. That's not dysfunction. Right. But is that, I mean, when you are, you know, going through suicidality, like, no, then we're in the level of dysfunction. Like that's, I mean, I can say from experience, um, regardless of whether you're, you're white knuckling through your, your teaching, which I did too. Um, So that's the problem. Where do we draw the line of dysfunction and what, you know, when, and then there's also, it's, it's really tricky and it's really hard to say, but one thing I did realize or read and, and realize in my research, and then also just living now in the DSM dysfunction really meant like you couldn't hold down a job and you weren't living independently for some time. And it's only recently that this term quality of life has come into it. Like it limits my quality of life. And that's so interesting. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be that way that we're diagnosing based on quality of life. Um, But, you know, to some degree, it's just that that can be a slippery slope is what I'm trying to say from just being someone who really, again, I used my diagnoses against myself, not for myself. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to prevent people from doing. And I should say diagnoses are, can be a huge relief. They've been a relief to many of my friends and they find a lot of solace in it. And that's a wonderful thing. And then we can use autism as an example where that's a very empowering diagnosis for a lot of people. That community rallies around their diagnosis. They, you know, re-termed it neurodiversity. I mean, they're really mm-hmm. an example of how that can work, you know, to one's benefit. But what I want to do with my book and with my work is prevent, especially young people, from using a diagnosis as their identity to limit themselves and think they can't achieve things. You know, it's so interesting. I've never put this together with what you're talking about with mental illness, but I was a I was a physically sickly child i had a neurological problem that didn't actually my brain had to mature frankly you know Um, my physiological brain had to to mature and it did and i got better and the headache stopped and uh, anyway i had my hypothalamus didn't function correctly but my first therapy when i was 23 was about and this is fascinating for me to think about that i thought of myself as a sick person I had identified with being sick and I was always worried I was going to get sick. I didn't talk about it much, but in here, I was worried I was going to get sick. I was careful about doing things. I didn't want to push myself too much, all that kind of thing. And yet probably someone looking on the outside of me wouldn't have thought that, but on the inside of me, I was really filled with fear. And that was part of what my whole beginning therapy was all about. Wow. I mean, that is exactly, that was my experience as well, which is that I started, you know, I basically, everything was going to be a new manic episode or a new depressive episode or a new cause for anxiety to the point that I really, you know, sort of stopped, well, I did stop living my life and and stop finding joy in things. Um, It had gone on for so long. I mean, 25 years is such a long time to be doing that. Um, But to your point too, when I stopped treating myself as a sick person, Mm -hmm. I started to get well. I mean, that was really- 
where it, it, you know, it's like, well, but, but the thing that worries me, you know, as a professor, and I see this, I have students come to me asking for accommodations, um, like longer test times or, you know, more time on their papers. And then they show me a diagnosis. And I say, and I know this is how universities work, but I say to them, I would have given you this accommodation without a diagnosis. Right. I don't want them to think like I can't ask for help <laughs> mm-hmm. because I have to show that I'm sick to get any help to have, you know, I mean, differentiated teaching is like teaching 101. I mean, that's what we do is we're supposed to look at what students need individually. But so, you know, again, it goes to that point that are these young people seeing themselves as sick and what is that going to do to them? Oh, that's a great, great point. You have been phenomenally successful as a writer and an interviewer. Yes, so yes, I, I was talk very about lucky. That part of your life? Yeah, I mean, that was those were really the the high points. You know, it's hard writing a memoir. You have to decide what to keep in and what to leave out. Well, you didn't but I was horn very much. <laughs> no, I didn't want to do that. But I mean, really, given the degree and the, I had severe mental illness, so so the things I accomplished were wonder. I mean, they were they were very they're very impressive on paper. They were so painful though that I have trouble really touting them or making myself seem better than someone with severe mental illness who is now living on the street, right? Like it just, it just happened. I have a lot of privilege to start. I'm a white woman, you know, and I grew up middle-class and I have a lot, you know, I have, I have an education. Yeah, my parents. Family yeah. Family. So like I have way more, um, I had way more going for me to push. And that's not to say that someone with all the same things couldn't also end up in a, you know, not achieving maybe what I achieved, but, but I did, I was very lucky. Um, You know, I always wanted to be a writer. There was sort of, I never chose a career. This is just what I did. I didn't choose wisely, by the way, people. (laughs) I would not recommend this. Um, Do you want any stability in your life? Writing is not it. Um, But I, I really did fall in love with interviewing. I think because it was a space where I could just, I used to call it zenning out. Like I would zen out. I just would become invisible. And I just let the interviewee, like it was their show. And their, their kind of, it was just finding ways to then it was always print interviews that I did. So finding, you know, what they said that was going to give me all of them to put on paper. Hmm. Um, so whatever I could get from them. And and I was very lucky to work for the Paris review, which does long form interviews. So they were really extraordinary. And they sent me to Japan. I interviewed Kenza Burrow Owe, who's a Nobel laureate. And I went to Spain um, and interviewed uh, Javier Marias, who's a really amazing fiction writer. And, But, you know, again, if I'd gone into those times, it was so complicated because they were achievements. And yet there was so much suffering. I mean, when I think I loved Japan, um, but I was really ill there. Like I wasn't well. And and I'm lucky I, I really did white knuckle through those things. And I think I left them out of the book because I felt like it would seem, um, I guess, you know, not privileged, but but sort of ungrateful or something to complain about this incredible situation and gift that I'd been given. Just my common sense told me that, that even just traveling for someone who already feels unstable in her home with the doors closed and not seeing people then to travel and to be that stimulated and to be in a different environment that must've really made things tough. You're a really good therapist. Like you're a really good psychologist te- <laughs> because you just nailed it. As I've been getting well, I mean, one thing I did, have done, and it's been hard, is decide who I am and what I can do and what I want to do without saying it's because of my mental illness. It's because of my diagnosis. I don't travel. I don't like to do it. I mean, I will for for work, of course, and I don't mind doing it for work for some reason, but I traveling is very destabilizing for me. And that's hard to explain to people. And and instead of saying, oh, it's because I'm sick, I have to say, no, I really just don't like it. I just don't like the way it makes me feel. I just don't. I feel all out of sorts. I don't like being a tourist. <laughs> it's just Well, and I uh, think what you're talking about, if I'm listening correctly, is is that this whole identification with your diagnosis is something that you're you're trying to say to people 
You know, it's just not a good idea. It's, it's certainly you want to accept it. You want to learn from it what you can. Well, not, not, not accept it blindly, but right. learn, educate yourself about it. See what fits, see what doesn't, but not then say, oh, well, I have this, so I can't do that. Or I, you know, not see it as particularly limiting, but it's, but mainly you just don't want to say, you know, I have panic disorder and, and, and I do, I have panic disorder, but mm-hmm. I am not panic. I, that that's one fact yeah. about me. Yeah, exactly. And I think too, one thing I would have said, except, but as you were talking, I thought agree with your diagnosis, right? So if someone gives yes. you a diagnosis that doesn't feel right, that's because these diagnoses aren't really firm. They're not really solid. And you have every right to say, you know, that doesn't feel right to me. Can we talk about that right. um, with whoever's doing the diagnosing? So, yeah. So find one that you agree with. that's going to help you. Um, again, I mean, this just this idea that they can be used for or against ourselves. And unfortunately, you know, un- autism has a lot of positive connotations just in the culture. It's associated often with genius. And, um, and I'm not saying it's an easy diagnosis by any measure. And that's certainly not true of the students with autism that I taught and with many people with autism. But that's just to say it has a kind of um, connotation, a positive connotation that many other diagnoses don't. Yeah. Right. I think about personality tests. You know how we take a personality test and they always have a shadow side and a positive side, like a (laughs) negative and a positive. I wish that mental health diagnoses had a negative and a positive side. And then maybe they'd be more useful. Like then we could say, yeah, this is, you know, I have major depressive disorder, but it allows me to, I don't know, how nice, but like, you know, (laughs) it allows me to do something. I mean, one thing that also really helped me was to learn about not just what emotions are, but to learn more about the brain and how our brains work. And I I really um, kind of agree with or gravitate toward evolutionary psychiatry and evolutionary medicine. And I know it has its problems and it's Can you critics. explain I that, understand the, that. The yeah, yeah. So it, it basically looks at one great way to describe it. Evolutionary psychiatry, traditional psychiatry says, how can we fix this? Evolutionary psychiatry is why does this happen? And how was it beneficial to us at one time as a species? Interesting. So if we look at anxiety, well, it was very beneficial when oh, we were yeah. being hunted by lions. Like I kind of joke, and it was one of the first times I could be a little bit light about what had happened to me and what I went through was that if if we were on the, the plains, if we were on the savannah and being hunted by lions, like you wanted me in your clan because I am constantly looking for danger. You I'm like a lion. Huge amygdala. Huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like lions all over the place. And I'm just answering email, you know? So it's just that we don't have the the most of us do not live under imminent threat of death most of the time. And I'm talking about Americans, obviously a very privileged country, but we aren't living in that situation. So we have this brain that is designed to predict and often to predict. So to keep us alive. Mm -hmm. And so then that suddenly made sense to me and my brain wasn't this terrible thing holding me back. It wasn't some dark abyss, like Freud said. It wasn't some big neuronal misfiring chemical, this or that. It was, it's just primitive and it's just trying to keep me alive at all times. And I befriended my brain and I befriended my mind and really learned how to notice, okay. And it doesn't, I still have panic attacks. I mean, it didn't make anything go away. So yeah. (laughs) So Yeah. Yeah, I know that my panic disorder has definitely given me empathy. I mean, I, you know, you can't have a panic attack and feel like your body has been invaded by something foreign that you don't, you don't have a sense of what it might be to hear voices or what it might be to, to have suicidal ideation when you really you're for those minutes and seconds that you are, that you are panicking, you, you don't recognize yourself anymore. And so it's, yeah. Yeah, it's really given me much more empathy. So so what's this next book about? You said there's a sequel. Yeah, so it's about how I healed and why we tell people that they cannot heal completely and that they cannot. And it really looks at the terms like, okay, there we do talk about recovery from mental illness, but often that means managing your symptoms and or you know lessening your symptoms. And I decided I was going to cure myself. I was going to actually fully heal and fully recover without, you know, and so I'm looking at 
what that meant and what I went through and all the stages of trying to resolve how healing was going to look for me because it's going to look different for every person. Also looking at why we don't tell people that they can heal. I mean, imagine if when you broke your leg, you went in and the doctor was like, okay, this is what we're going to do. And we're going to treat you. And I understand. And you'll never heal. (laughs) You will always be broken. (laughs) You know, I mean, how many of us would stay in the boot or allow, you know, to get the treatment that we need? I mean, I think that there's just, just, we're doing such a disservice to people. And I had been told I couldn't heal, but the, I don't know psychiatrist who really changed everything for me also changed everything for me a second time. I still see him. He's still my psychiatrist and he's very open and transparent about the problems with diagnoses and and all of that. But he told me a story about a woman he treated with schizoaffective disorder, a very severe diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, And he said that he got her off medication and treated her and he wasn't boasting. This was within a, a context where it made sense. And she was now a, an executive at Google and has no, and has is completely cured. And I was like, what? I want to be an executive. I don't want to be an executive at Google, but I was like, oh, to be that well. And I I decided I was going to do it for myself. And I didn't even tell him because I was so afraid he'd say, no, you can't. Um, And I didn't want to know that. So it's, you know, and it's really the, that story. It's, it's not just a story of healing, but it's looking at given that we don't really know what mental illness is completely, we don't have diagnoses that really work for us. I understand why we aren't telling people they can heal, but we need to start and we need to start looking at what does healing mean and how will we know when we're there? And so it's my step-by-step of how I got there and determined what is healing for me. Can you give us a little hint of what that is from your perspective? Well, there are certain markers um, that I've, you know, that I put in place. There are a lot of rituals and routines that I do that, that, you know, again, just create kind of like a baseline so that I know when I'm, you know, when something is like going awry or whatever it might be. But one of the big ones is I have a cat. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I have a cat and I, you know, for someone who couldn't live independently, for someone who wanted to end her life, for someone who couldn't take care of herself to have this creature that I love and adore and take care of and spoil. And like, you know, every day I'm just, and he's a weird cat. I mean, I want you to know he's a really weird (laughs) cat and he's not very affectionate, you know, like he's an odd one, but I love him so much. And it's, it's just such a sign of wellness for me and such a sign that I've healed, but it's also, I mean, I I live in a completely different brain. It is so different. I mean, I am just, someone asked me, well, is it possible that you never had mental illness, that you never had anything wrong? And I'm like, no, that it's such an interesting question, but no, that's not possible. I mean, it's a totally different existence that I'm in now. Well, it's another quote because you did get suicidal. Here's a little trigger warning for anybody, but suicidality is a vortex. It's deafening and silent. The darkest place I've ever touched. That's what you said. And that's a real statement. Yeah, it really is. And, and I so want to, you know, again, I have zero scientific evidence for this, but for me, not being told that I could possibly heal really helped me. It it increased my suicidality. When I thought there was no hope, I'm going to live like this for the rest of my life. How could I not? Why would I want to live that life? I mean, it just didn't make sense. Even if it was a stretch, which at that time it was, even if it seemed impossible, we have to tell people it's an option and have examples of people who've done it, more public examples. So I have to ask about your family. Is your sister still your champion? Yeah, they're they're amazing. My mom is very much in the new book. So is my dad. So they're more in the book than they were because we have a stronger relationship. But one thing I've had to do to heal and, and that I have continued to do is I can have three areas in my life. That's it. I just pick three. And that's all I give my attention to and all I give my energy to. And they are writing, teaching, and my family. Mm-hmm. So I'm not hunting for a partner. I don't have hobbies. <laughs> I will never play volleyball. Like these things are out. <laughs> I don't go to brunch. Oh, you know, like it's, 
And, and you know, some of that's really hard because I'm I'm not a great friend. And some people see that as being a sign of mental health, right? You've got a core support group and, and yeah, I have my family, but I'm trying to be their support now as my parents are aging and trying to really be there for them. But my sister is absolutely, you know, she's still there that she lives six blocks from me. My parents each live a mile from me and, and they are getting older. And I think another sign that I've healed, um, my mother fell and broke her wrist and I, she was watching my sister's dog and I had to be on a podcast. And it was just like, you know, the, the mm-hmm. perfect storm. And I was able to like get the dog into care and <laughs> get my mom to the hospital and do the podcast and then get down and stay with my mom at the hospital and like not enjoy it, but not make a drama out of it. And I thought, wow, this is really weird, <laughs> you know, and this is, healthy like but yeah it, it fits with your yeah. three parts your triad your, it had to do with your writing it had to do with your teaching and it had to do with your family so exactly there you go so as long as you stay within that kind of a balance yeah three-legged stool then you're fine you know you do yeah. quite well well that's yep. great good for you I can't tell you, and I, I would love to read your next book. And w- does it already have a pub date or? Not yet. So I'm just finishing it. And hopefully I would like to get it out as soon as possible, just because I want people to have that message of healing along with, you know, again, I think questioning diagnoses and knowing their limitations is really important because that was a way for me to kind of disidentify and, and allow an option of healing, which I never had before. So that was, you know, pathological is like step one. And then, but I really want to give people, you know, the next step, which is healing and hope. So hopefully it'll be out soon. Well, it's been a a pleasure. I told you before the actual, before we started recording for the interview that you are one of the few people that I've interviewed that actually emailed me back and said, oh, I'm really looking forward to it. So I knew that I was going to feel very comfortable with you from the very beginning because you're just very open and engaging and obviously kind. So thank you so very much. And Self Work listeners, thank you. And the book is called Pathological, The True Story of Six Misdiagnoses by Sarah Fay. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening in today. I really enjoy these interviews. I learned so much. And Sarah and I just had sort of an immediate connection. I found her sincere and just very nice and polite and engaging in a way that's a bit different. Her book, again, is Pathological, The True Story of Six Misdiagnoses. And she talks so clearly about all of that, and quite respectfully, of the psychiatric and psychological profession. So thank you once again for being here. You know, I'm very, very grateful. Please be safe. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.